Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, just a little bit about me. I used to work for a finance company, American Insurance. No, and I worked there for seven years doing a lot of integration work. Then I moved into Red Hat, so I did a bunch of like, you know, integration work, a lot of like data pipeline buildings with Apache Camel, and then I did a bunch of OpenShift and Kubernetes stuff. And now I move into the, uh, the Kafka, more of the Kafka world. So in Red Panda, what we do is we are a completely rewrite of Kafka uh, protocol. So we wrote, we wrote everything in C++ basically. Um, so, Currently, we're hosting a bunch of, you know, Kafka-like Red Panda cluster across the entire cloud platform, right? So we do that on AWS, we do on GCPs, and a lot of them. And one of the common thing, things that we've observed, so these are one of some of the, the metrics I've gotten from our production. This is one of our, one of our uh, production environment, is that what we found with these clusters uh, is that people are not actually utilizing the full capacity of the broker. A lot of the, because the, the, the way we rewrite our broker is that we simply do a lot of CPU poolings. So we take care, in, a, in the way that we write it is we take control of every thread in the, in the CPUs and then we continuously to pull from every request and see if it works. And we, we've seen a lot of behaviors that um, most of the clusters and most of the brokers are not being utilized enough. And another thing that we um, kind of see what people are doing is a lot of data ping-ponging, right? So I don't know if in the, in the Kafka world, at least in the data pipeline, pipeline world, this is a very common thing is that if you want to have a consumer, for instance, this consumer wants to uh, serialize their data in Evro, and, but you cannot control what the producer gives you, right? So what they would do is they would probably do some kind of transformations. And the way they do transformation is to, well, you know, set up a data pipeline, and this data pipeline doesn't do much. It just does some data transformations, and they'll write it back to the broker, and then it gets to the consumer, right? That's kind of a very common way of setting things up. And the way to set up these pipelines, you need to set up cluster pipelines, you need to set up machines, and you need to set up a lot of things. Um, the, the problem is that there's a lot of networking overhead on top of that, right? So there's a lot of data ping-ponging. So that's why we're thinking, what if we can do the transformation in the broker so we don't have to you know, spend all this resource, all this extra effort of doing a lot of data ingestions and um, a lot of the data going out, if we can limit that to make it a lot easy, it, wouldn't it, that be a lot more efficient of doing things? So that was why we're thinking, all right, that's good. So what do we have to do in order to get that working? So let me see. So there's a couple of things that we need to take care of. Um, so in order to actually put a data transformation in the broker, there are a couple of things that we want to make sure it works. Safety is the first issue, right? In terms of safety, because you know what Kafka is really like? It's actually writing your disk, your, your, your log into disk. And before it writes to this, it writes to memory first. And if we want to actually apply a letting people putting their program that they write in the broker, that's good. But how do we make sure that it's safe, right? Uh, like the biggest problem with, you know, with a lot of data safety problem is that they get access to the place in the memory that you're not supposed to touch, and they play around with the data, they change the data and all that, that's not safe enough. So for, for us, it's not, it's probably not so safe if we, if we let people to do that in the broker. So we have to make sure everything's safe. And another thing is efficiency. We went for the efficiency because we rewrite the whole thing to get rid of the JVMs, to get off the virtual memory. So we want to make sure that we are harnessing everything from the CPUs and from the memory. So how do we do that? So these are the kind of things that we're looking at. And the very last one is, you know, getting a good user experience. And to have a good user experience doing transformations in the broker is not that easy. Because if you think about what Kafka is, or what Kafka protocol, all this distributing system is, well, first of all, your clients, in order for it to scale, you need to set up, you need to, uh, create, set up a bunch of brokers. So you have multiple brokers in your clusters, and your clients connect to all of it. And then it does the replication. So, and before the replication, it always have these leaders and producers and consumers, right? And then leaders and followers. These are all the things that need to have in a Kafka brokers. 
and as well as that it has petitions. The way that we, the reason why they have petitions or we have petitions in the Kafka world is because we, we want to allow parallelism, right? So we can have in a single topics, everything gets split into different petitions and they get to become different leaders in different brokers so that when you have the same consumer groups, um, they, can call, they can go access different brokers. So you're, you're kind of scaling things out. You're scaling your resource out. That's kind of what Kafka is doing. But if we're doing all these transformations from the user's perspective, how do I make sure that these transformation logics, these tr transformation topics was written, um, was deployed into every single one of the clusters? And then also another question is, how do we want to make sure, how do we know that what kind of programming languages our developers are using? We want to make sure it's polyglot so we can let the programmer, the developers to choose what languages they want to work on. But at the same time running at a very basic level of closer to the machines. That's kind of the way we want to achieve it. And that's when we, when we start looking at WebAssembly. Um, so WebAssembly is this a uh, new way of programming where, well, it's not a new way of programming, but it's a new way of deploying your, your um, it allows you to use lower level programming languages. It originally started that way, so, and it, it compiles into machine understandable code, and that gets to be executed into the machine level, um, so your machine would understand what to do, and that gets glued into JavaScript, and then everything executed in the browser. So that was good, right? So, we're, so one of the implementation of um, that was Photoshop, right? Photoshop, they want to bring all the experiences, what they do into a browser, but it's really hard to achieve that because Photoshop was originally written in C++ and everything, a lot of them were very low level. They need everything to be very efficient. So to, to run that, they need to have run it in the more lower level code. So the way they did it is they recompiled everything into binary format and then the, and having JavaScript to work with that binary code in order for that to work. That's what web, assemb web assembly looks like. And we were thinking, all right, this seems to be very promising. The reason why is because of its architecture. So web assembly that let you run in the sandbox environment. So basically what happens is they let you control everything in that sandbox environment. They let you control the memories that, that you control, the thread, the CPUs, all the resource within that sandbox environment. Meaning that the, whole, the, the program running in that sandbox environment cannot go beyond this guest environment. So everything in the host is untouchable, unreadable to the, the programs running in the sandbox itself, right? So that brings us safety. So we know that once we put the program in the broker, it only has access to the things it allows to, right? And the way that WebAssembly works is that it only has four different types, two types of integers and two types of float. Basically, that's it. For more larger, more complex data structures, it then turns your in integers into pointers or it points to that particular um, uh, data, more complex data structures in your memory. So that's how it works. Right, so it's very efficient, it's very low level, it's very quick, so we like that. But it was running in the browser, so we couldn't really use that in the broker. But the thing is like, there is something called WASI. So this WebAssembly system interface, letting us, was able to let us to access a lot of the low level um, resource that's available for us in the computer itself. Right, so it gives us this very portable operating system experiences. So I will be able to access the files. I will be able to access the sockets. Basically, that's actually what I actually about need um, in terms of brokers, because all I'm doing is writing the data, execute it, compute it, and then put it back into another partition. That's kind of what I do in another memory, right? That's what I do. So if we have all this, we can then put our program in that sandbox environment and then putting that sandbox environment in our broker and it's safe, we can run it. And we like it because another thing that we really like about it is the guest meter in CPUs. Because 
in brokers, what does broker do? Broker is very busy on accepting ingested traffic and then putting that away, right? So that's what it's busy doing. All the computations goes there. And we want to make sure that is the first class citizen in the broker. So everything that broker needs to be done is over here. What the, the data transformation is just, you know, if there's extra resource, if there's other things that needs to be done, I can do it here. So in order for us to do that, we need to put in some guest metering. And for that, we were able to set that in our um, WebAssembly libraries. So in terms of uh, CPU timing, if it executes more than 3,000 milliseconds, then we say, all right, you, you are stalled. This process is stalled. Let's move on to another process. Let's move on to another task. So it doesn't block your CPU. It doesn't block your thread. So it will then go back to doing whatever it was doing. And then once, the, once this task has finished, it will go back to WebAssembly and do the transformations if it's not blocked. And that guest metering allows us to be more free and more scalable in terms of having that in there as well. And another thing is memory. So memory plays a big part in, at least in Red Panda's um, architecture. We did that by pre-allocating a, a, a set of memories per thread. So we were able to write things really quickly into memories. That's what we do, right? But the thing is, for these type of transformations, it can get very fragmented in your memory. So sometimes if I need bigger data structure, I probably couldn't get that, that numbers of memories allocated. So that's going to be a problem. But these type of interface allows us also to pre-allocate memories for our, each of our sandbox. So we were able to pre-allocate um, a set of memories for them to actually run the transformations in. So that makes things a lot faster. So we really like that, uh, really like that ability to do it. Another one of the uh, really cool things about WebAssembly is because it's a way that it can support a lot of languages. It translates um, a lot of languages like uh, Golang, Rust, C++, and I know uh, Python does that too. I don't know about Java. Java's been really funny about WebAssembly, but, um, but I mean, we can pro uh, there's a lot of interpreters that allows you to turn that into a assembly-like code, right? And these code can also be turned into machine-like code that is better understandable by machines, right? So it allows us to give our users experience of using different languages and compile a bit, making it to be transformable. And the SDK allows us to give a guardrail to how you write your transformations. So we were able to set a method of things that, so we were able to say, if you want to do your transformations, this is an event that you're listening to, and these are the records that you're getting. So every single time when there's a record that goes into the topic that it's listening from, it gets triggered, and then it can run this particular set of code inside the broker and does the transformations, and then export it somewhere else. So that's how we did it. Of course, we have to do a lot of uh, maybe eyes. Uh, we need to do a lot of our own implementations of what each of the um, each one of the things needs to be handled in our program. But that was we were able to expose this interface to the SDK so we can get that things done. So that's kind of what we did for the uh, for the transformations. And another thing that we need to take care of is the user experience. Not every one of them are experienced, you know, WebAssembly developers. So we want to make sure it's, it's the easiest for people to get started with. So we also went ahead and create this, uh, we went ahead of this uh, compiler. So we attached that uh, TinyGo compilers into our own toolings, allow people to get started with ease, with ease. So you can actually type in, RPK transform, and that allows you to initiate that particular structure for, uh, for your transformations. And we can actually build that um, in your environment to build, to convert your transformation code, the developer, the, the code developer writes into a wasm binary. And then you can deploy that into the broker. So what happens in the broker is that once one broker gets that particular wasm, because we have this consensus um, algorithm already built in, into our, into our uh, 
brokers, it gets replicated across all the brokers. So you only have to deploy it once, and all the broker would have the copies of it. Um, and the way we do that, and then when, when executing, we uh, designated the space for time. So every single one of the broker, they will load this WASM into the memories, and they will start the virtual machines, that listen to that particular leader in the petition, and then that's gonna execute the transformations. And that's how it's done. So kind of a quick overview of how we decide on if we wanna do transformations and if we wanna, how do we do that? So that's why how we embark on the journey of adopting WebAssembly into our interfaces. So the reason why I talk about stateless pipeline is because if you look at all the pipelines that people are building right now, majority of them are stateless. They don't have states, they do simple transformations, they do simple reroutings, they do like really easy filtering, that's most of what they do. Some of them does more stateful work, right? And some of them does like higher level analytic jobs where they you know, need larger data, data sets and they'll process it. And sometimes like really super batch jobs. And the majority of them is down here at the stateless pipeline. And for us, the best suited pipelines are the stateless one, right? Because if you think about it, because we hold everything in memory in the broker, we don't persist anything because it's gonna introduce blockage in the, for the CPUs. So these are not ideal workload for the data pipeline processing uh, inside the broker. So we have said that you know, if you really want to do data transformations, stateless is probably the best place for you to actually do it, right? So if you want to do simple transformations, if you want to do simple rerouting, this is the best place where you can do it. So basically, if you want to do that, you can write your simple transformations into uh, Web, uh, and, the, and compile it into WebAssembly and then deploy that into the broker. And that's how we've done it. So here is a super quick demo uh, to show you how it's done. So I have this, um, let me show. Can I show? So this is a quick demo of a real-time data machine learning. I'm trying to, so the way that we, um, we can use this type of transformation is that we can use that for AI inference or for for a larger machine learning load, right? So this one is, we're trying to get a lot of um, the real-time data from Uber, right? And we wanna see if there's a correlation between, you know, the destinations of, of your, of where your, your house is to the restaurant itself. So we're collecting all these data and we wanna quickly, you know, calculate the latest model. So I got this from, uh, from Lyft and they're doing like some kind of eating stuff, right? So, so we're getting a lot of ingestions from the food delivery and we wanna, we wanna actually come up with a better, better uh, model, like the near closest model that can get to estimate the time of deliveries. So these, these are all the things that happen. So we're collecting a lot of data and we wanna feed this data into machine learning and then have it calculate the latest, um, latest like um, time, estimate time for deliveries, that's it. So if you look at what people do normally when they have a bunch of data is they will probably do some kind of analytics. So this is a very typical Jupyter notebook where people are getting a bunch of data in, in, coming in. So I'm looking at, okay, so if I have all these data, uh, hold on, let me see if I have this. Oops, to refresh it. I'm getting these data and the, I'm getting this data from here as well. So I wanna calculate if there's a correlation between the age of the driver or the time when I deliver or the, um, or the destinations of my home and the restaurant itself. It looks like there's a correlation, right? And if you look at the vehicle of what this, this, uh, what this I'm not sharing, right? We should tell me. Uh, how do I stop sharing? Perfect. 
So I was showing a Jupyter notebook. And this Jupyter notebook is getting a lot of data coming in. So this is a um, this is the uh, the rating of this particular driver, and this is the latitude and longitude of where your restaurant is. This is where the latitude and longitude of your house is, and this is the time it takes for the delivery. So we're trying to find the correlations between these numbers, and we see that there is a correlation between the age of the driver and the destination of the driver, but the type of vehicle is not related to how long the food is going to be delivered to you, right? So what does it relate to? What I'm trying to get. Well, you see, the raw data I'm getting is I'm getting a latitude and longitude for the location of the, the restaurants and the location of your delivery, delivery destinations. And I want to calculate the actual distance between those two, right? So I need to write a, like a geometry. This is where geometry actually works, like in real life. Um, so you can cal calculate a try, kind of like actual destinations and all that. So this is good when you're doing like long running batch processes, you can define everything, your Spark and all that, that works in your, or your Python app. But if you're getting everything from your, from your, your edge devices, you're not going to do that. You're not going to you know, get anything right away. So can we do the calculations in the broker? Do the destination calculations right away in the broker? Can we do that? Right? So that's why I want to talk about it. So in order for us to do that, I am writing a quick program. And this program does a very simple thing. It calculates the distance between the restaurants and delivery with geometry, right? It does that. So I just wrote a quick applications, and this one just calculates the, the straight destination of it. So when I take in all these destinations and longitude and latitude, I can quickly provide that to my model training. So that's called feature engineering. So I'm actually doing the feature engineering in my broker quickly. And, and, and once I'm done with that, I can then deploy that into my, into my brokers. So how do I do that? It's pretty easy. So I can do RPK. Transform. And build. Uh, I am not in the... So I can start building my, uh, my applications. So this is where my code was. I'm actually building things into, into WebAssembly. It's going to take some time for it to build. And then you'll find a WASM application that's been built for it. So if you look at the file directory itself, you see there is a WASM application that was generated by this. Then what I want to do is I can quickly deploy that into my into my broker. And I have two topics. I have two topics. One is the raw data topic and then model data. So I'm actually transforming from my raw data topics into my model data topic. And then it gets to point to my broker. And then if you look through the RPK list, you'll see that it's been deployed into my brokers and it's running on all three partitions. Um, and then if I then go into my console, and then you see now raw data has nothing, and then model data has nothing. So if I start putting information, if I start putting data into this raw data, what happens now is, let me see if I have any raw data that I can play with. Oops. Where is that? It's right here. I can just grab one of the data sets here. 
and then paste it into type text. If I put it into the topic here, and if you go back to the model, you'll see that data gets transformed right away. That's all inside the broker, and that's how it's done. So, as, uh, and then you can see we can deploy as many as we want, and everything gets transformed and deployed in the broker quickly, and that's how we did it. So, that's kind of the end of my uh, presentations. I think I'm ready for questions. Do you have any questions?